Stop 1, Introduction. The content for this audio tour was selected from an essay titled Three Voices by Phil Rogers. Quote, to work with clay is to be in touch with the taproot of life, unquote, Shoji Hamada. When one considers ceramic history in its broadest sense, a three-generation family of potters isn't particularly remarkable. Throughout the world, potters have traditionally handed down their skills and knowledge to their offspring, thus maintaining a living history that not only provided a family's continuity and income, but also kept the traditions of vernacular pottery making alive. The long traditions of the peasant or artisan potter are well documented and can be found in almost all civilizations where the generations are to be numbered in the tens or twenties or even higher. In this exhibition, we hear three very different voices. All are singing the same tune, each is using different words. Lineage can be a cross to bear as well as a helping hand up a very difficult ladder. Amongst these pots, there is ample evidence that both Shinsaku and Tomu have, to paraphrase the words of William Blake, driven their cart and plow over the bones of the dead. While Hamada Shoji, a pioneer, a master, a total one of a kind, continues to remind us of the power of clay and glaze and the depth of his own artistry and vision. Each of the Hamadas has forged a unique footprint in the history of family, while maintaining tradition and communication between the generations. Stop 2. HS27, HS37, H50. Like many artists who choose to carry the banner of a family legacy and, some might say, the cross of a famous father, both Shinsaku and Tomu were faced with the difficult balancing act of preserving tradition and, at the same time, establishing their own artistic identities. Hamada Shinsaku's pieces have a more predestined feel to them than Shoji's. There is a more obvious plan and less is left to chance. Maybe this is due to his training in industrial arts at Waseda University before apprenticing to his father. Interestingly, David Leach, much to his father's disgust, also studied industrial ceramics in Stoke on Trent. I suppose one might say that Shinsaku's style is calmer, less spontaneous, but nonetheless impressive for that. One can see his character in pieces such as HS27 and HS37. All of the fundamental elements of the Hamada workshop are there, but the pots have a much greater nearness to the original concept that created them. Hamada Shoji's work came close to improvisation at times, as with H50, but I don't think this is something that Shinsaku would entertain. This very different attitude of approach is what divides their work even through the route, the place, and the materials that are common to both. Stop 3. H41, H48, H52. Shoji believed that over-refinement and over-intellectualizing in the making of pottery is a mistake. He felt that pottery making should come from the gut and from the heart and not so much from the head. Once, he was asked by Leach how he could manage to glaze several hundred pots in a day without seeming to need any notes or planning ahead. To this he said, I simply look at the pot and ask what it wants. That was his genius, a seemingly infinite stream of ideas that came from his subconscious, an innate and wholly intuitive sense of pattern and placement coupled with a total confidence in his glazes and pigments, as in H41. Hamada wasn't concerned with being innovative, and yet he was. In his own way, he revolutionized ceramics in Japan. His assimilation of influences from a myriad of sources into a distinct and personal style was quite unheard of in a country that placed so much importance on the maintenance of tradition. Hamada had an intimate relationship with a limited palette of materials, and he knew that repetition didn't mean exactness. He reveled in the minor or subtle differences each time his hand and arm made the sugarcane motif, as in H48 and H52. Stop 4. H17, ML20. Hamada Shoji gave the kiln and the fire their due reverence for their contribution to his work. He had a relaxed attitude to the variants that a very large kiln offered, and mused for hours over the vagaries of the fire. Watching him work, I, as a potter, wonder at his calmness and serenity. The relaxed and unfettered way he decorated, for instance, is quite remarkable, and that he could do that as part of a team, while often watched and scrutinized by outsiders, is something few could do. He said, Making pottery should not be like climbing a mountain. It should be more like walking down a hill in a pleasant breeze. Hamada Shoji loved the controlled exuberance of the pouring ladle in H17 and ML20, where the arm often lent spontaneity and a greater sense than the brain alone could ever bring about, what Michael Cardew called the incidental or the accidental. Stop 5, HT130. Hamada Tomu trained initially as a sculptor at Tama Art University. He once told me that he had decided to become a potter very early on in his life, but that he needed to get away from Mishiko and the Hamada compound to experience new approaches and a different view of life and art. 
Coming back to the family home and workshops and to the life of a potter felt like a natural step despite his fine art education. Tomu has integrated a modernist view, a form of constructivism seen in architecture where lines and angles are employed to provide areas or planes that carry color or pattern. I decided to be a potter when I was three, Tomu wrote in an exhibition catalog at the Kanoyu Gallery in Mexico. My family allowed me to choose of my own free will. I was interested in art in general, so I often spent time in my grandfather's or father's studio. Indeed, there is a well-known photograph reproduced in the late Susan Peterson's book, Shoji Hamada, Potter's Way and Work. It shows the very young Tomu decorating a press-molded bottle with a brush and pigment. Hamada Shoji encouraged his grandson, saying, He's quite an artist because he's a child. No one can do better than children. The sculptural background is obvious when one looks at Tomu Hamada's pieces. The shapes are quite complicated, often angular in form, and they don't reply upon the relaxed throwing style of Hamada Shoji or the classical, technically competent throwing of Shinsaku. The shapes are designed to provide a canvas for his enamel decoration, and they are cleverly orchestrated to perform that function, as in HT-130. This kind of premeditated construction, rather than the more nonchalant throwing style of his forebears, is a dangerous path to walk. Stop 6. HS30, HT96, HT129, HT104, HT134. A third enamel firing has played a significant role in all three of the potters here. Hamada Shoji's use of enamel was typically free and expressive. He very cleverly partially decorated pots in the second firing, leaving areas, perhaps alternate squares or roundos, blank to receive the freely painted enamel later. Often the enamel related to, and complemented, a brush pattern already in place. Shinsaku's use of enamel is in keeping with his overall approach, that is to say organized rhythmic patterns that often encompass a form, lending to pattern and form a unity in the same way that a string ties a parcel and traces the silhouette in HS30. Tomu's repeated patterns in enamel are complex, studied, and quite unlike Shoji's. His very considered roundels and panels appear like the patterns one sees in textiles, but glimpsed behind a screen, creating surfaces with a very clear spatial, almost three-dimensional effect, as in HT96. Tomu's exposure to other sources of reference for his decoration are also apparent. Textiles, as I have already mentioned, but also Art Nouveau and Art Deco influences are represented in works such as HT129. Tomu Humada has cleverly combined the structured enamel patterns with gent gentle organic sculptural forms in HT-104 and HT-134.